Welcome to a startup edition of the Total Picture Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Clayton. And joining me today from beautiful California is uh, Brian Karras, a former Facebook executive who started not one, but two companies. One's called Playbook Media, a digital marketing agency that specializes in growth marketing for startups, and a company called GrowTal, uh, think Grow Talent, a Silicon Valley-based marketplace that specializes in connecting marketing professionals with companies. So, Brian, welcome to Total Picture. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background, you know, specifically your experience working for Facebook and why you decided to create not just one, but two startups. Yeah, sure. Peter, thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and yeah, happy to give you a little bit of background. Um, so I've been doing digital marketing for uh, 13 years now. I uh, kind of been in Silicon Valley the whole time. I uh, started out doing direct response marketing at a company called Quinn Street, uh, who was one of the earlier uh, companies who started uh, direct response marketing online um, and was in the Legion business there. And then was at Marin Software for a couple of years, uh, helping their top clients with SEM marketing. Marin at the time was the top aggregator of SEM spend uh, for Google and uh, and I think it was Yahoo and Bing at the time. And uh, then I moved over to Facebook where I spent four years at Facebook uh, working with a variety of different businesses there with their marketing strategies. So I worked in financial services, helping big brokerage firms like uh, TD Ameritrade and E-Trade and then uh, worked a bit with some of the big banks like PNC Bank and Wells Fargo. And then I moved over uh, from there and helped to found a team within uh, the e-commerce uh, vertical of, uh, of Facebook. And this was called the activation team in which we helped uh, earlier stage companies uh, that we thought had the capacity to grow quickly with user acquisition within Facebook's ad platform and we helped them to build out all their kind of foundational needs that they that they needed to have to actually grow up their user acquisition and a lot of that uh, w went beyond just pulling the levers within the platform itself and went into their creative strategies and how they're positioning their products and how they were driving lifetime value of customers and sort of deeper things uh, that allow them to scale up their marketing. And one of the things I noticed was that I felt a lot of the agencies in the ecosystem out, out there were more focused on just the media strategy, maybe a little bit of creative, but just kind of pulling the levers in the platform. They weren't going deep enough to really help these companies to scale. And so I knew there was a bit of a hole uh, out there in terms of the services industry and in, in helping these companies. And uh, the Facebook, um, I was maybe circa 2000 and 16, 2017, uh, going into the first election, um, got a little bit political, um, you could say, right? There's Cambridge Analytica and all these other things. And at the same time, the company was getting really large and more bureaucratic. And so there was a little bit of this, um, you know, want to maybe do something different just because of, uh, you know, some of the headwinds the company was facing. But then uh, Facebook decided to take our little activation team and turn it into what's called the disruptors team at Facebook now, um, which is very focused on startups, but usually later stage startups, people who have raised a series C, series D, and usually they were already scaled up from a user acquisition standpoint, had already figured out all those unit economics and build a, built out a foundation. And they pulled us off from working with those earlier stage companies. And I knew there was a hole in that services. So I decided, hey, I'm going to go leave Facebook, go start my own agency, focusing on these earlier stage businesses and helping them to build the foundation that they need to, they need to grow their user acquisition. Um, and uh, I can go into, uh, into Growtel from there if you're... This is the classic, I saw a problem and decided to do something about it right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so know, how did Grotel kind of uh, morph or evolve out of Playbook? So, you know, there's some interesting things, you know, in terms of trends in the industry. Uh, as running an agency for a few years, that I started to notice. Um, one is in Silicon Valley, uh, in particular, uh, and, you know, within the venture community, there's a lot of pressure for businesses 
to take their marketing in-house. They look at running Facebook or, or Google as it's almost an intellectual property um, to have the expertise to run it themselves. Uh, and I don't necessarily view it that way um, because I think that people can copy strategies pretty easily. Even if somebody figures out something that's special, word travels fast in terms of different strategies and marketing. But that said, there is a feeling of that. And so people wanna bring things in house. It's also can be cost effective if you're looking at different agency models to do so. So there's one, one aspect people need, wanna bring things in house. Another aspect is that uh, there are a lot of people who are in the actual marketing teams of different kind of venture backed companies that had been promised really nice exits um, and had been paid a lot in equity. And a lot of these businesses, I think, um, you know, took too much funding, had too much pressure to grow too quickly. And uh, so, you know, whenever you have uh, good marketers in those companies and they don't get the exit they're looking for, they're not getting paid as much as the, the market should be paying them. And if they're looking at the next startup, it kind of looks at starting all over again. You need to go in and take the risk. Is this business really going to, to make it? When there's an alternative path, and that alternative path is you go independent and you go and you consult and you help businesses with their UA strategies. And that actually, I think, can be a lot more lucrative for marketers to do that. And I started to see more and more people that I respected moving into independent consulting. And so, you know, I started to see, okay, now there's two sides of this equation. There's, there's businesses that want the expertise in-house, and then there's talent that don't want to work in-house, but are willing to work with them. So, you know, a way of doing some matchmaking there seems to make sense. Um, so I started to think about that in uh, 2019, and we started kind of testing the model uh, internally at our, at our agency by shifting around some of our pricing structures to be more pay for on-demand service and found that the unit economics really lined up well. And then when COVID hit, uh, we said, okay, well, there's gonna be a in big influx of supply here of people that are gonna be looking for work. And so we, should, we can hurry this process up and actually launch GrowTal and get people in. So that way we could build up the supply side of our marketplace. And then as we come out of COVID, we're starting to see more and more businesses looking to hire again, and we're, we have that kind of supply ready to go. So you're operating basically like an RPO. Yeah, right? I, would, I would say that's, that's effectively right, although I'm not 100% familiar with the RPO model, um, so I don't know necessarily the nuances between maybe what a traditional RPO does versus us. Right. Uh, but I would say that's... that's yeah, and so what, what do you see the advantage of, you know, like a, you, you are trying to attract these marketing experts, as you call them, um, mm -hmm. into, into uh, working on your platform on Growtel. What, what's the advantage of that over something like, a, like an Upwork or Craigslist? Yeah, the problem with Upwork is it's a race to the bottom. Um, no shit. So Jesus. Yeah, it, it really is. Uh, people go on there, they look to find who's the cheapest person who I think is going to be able to do, you know, the minimum viable work that I need to get done. Yeah. And they're uh, usually and for, in India or Pakistan yeah. or exactly. somewhere, you know, they're not here because nobody here can make 50 cents an hour. Right, right. And right. so here, if you're trying to go in and compete there, you have to give on your prices like crazy because they're very price transparent. It's not that we're not price transparent, we are, but, but they put it all on the platform. And so the user psychology is you're looking at all these different things and so you're trying to find the lowest cost and you're going through and trying to find that the right person at the lowest cost. And so for the provider, the expert on the platform, if you're a true expert, you're now competing on cost and you don't want to be doing that. And then if you're the person hiring, there's a good chance you're going to get somebody that's kind of crap. I've had very poor experiences hiring from Upwork and I've done it multiple times throughout the years. And uh, almost zero of those times have I been overly impressed with the person that I worked with. Um, and so we put in that kind of quality later, layer there. How are, how are you going about attracting, you know, real professionals to uh, participate in your platform? What, what kind of marketing strategy are you using to uh, get, you know, to get the A players? 
Yeah, so I mean, it helps that we've been doing this for a long time and we run an agency. So we know a lot of great people. Um, and so there's a lot of building from our initial network to start. Uh, and then we, we leverage other ways with paid advertising and job boards and things like that to bring people in as well. Uh, the trick is, is, is finding people that really meet our talent criteria, right? So, uh, you know, whenever we do reach out to the greater market, we have to make sure we truly vet those people where they're going to kind of come up to the, our standards. Um, so that can be a little bit difficult at the times, but we view it as really worth it because we want our clients, whenever they plug into our talent pool to say, you know, this is a no brainer, right? We got somebody who is really high quality and it was worth every penny. Well, let's talk about your clients a little bit. Who are some of the people who are using the platform currently? Yeah. So we have, uh, we have several, I mean, I, we a large handful of clients. We're still early stage. Um, so, you know, we have a few agencies who are using the platform. Um, we have uh, a few nonprofits like Simper Virons, if you know them, they uh, they do a bunch of protection of the redwoods up here. So I love like the variety of accounts we bring in. We're working with uh, a company called Bora, which does um, they're in the the health and medical space. We're working with Curology, which is a venture backed company um, on skincare. So really, we have a huge kind of variety of of clients. And that's one thing that I love about it. You know, our agency is really focused in on direct to consumer type of accounts, you know, um, and, uh, and this allows us to have a greater breadth of clients because um, really every business needs good marketing expertise. Uh, yeah. So we yeah. can, uh, you know, kind of find those, those specialty layers as well. Yeah. I saw that uh, Headspace was on your Client yeah. So, uh, so yeah, Headspace. So we have on, on our, um, on our website, we talk about some of the clients that our talent has worked with right. Headspace, just to be clear, is not a current client, but the, the, it's the idea there is to show that our, uh, our talent base has worked with a huge number of different types of businesses. And so we want people to know, Hey, look, like, they have the expertise of working with very big, you know, venture back high growth startups. Yeah. Um, and we can plug those people in. Yeah. I love Headspace. It's, it's a great app. Yeah. Um, it is. It's, yeah. So, yeah. so, um, call, you know, which one is it? Which one are you going to go with? <laughs> who does the screening when, you know, someone wants to participate in your platform? How does, how does that whole thing happen? Yeah, so we have uh, we have a standardized uh, screening process for uh, all of our different levels of expertise, which have been designed by people we know and trust. Uh, and so we we design different um, kind of standardized uh, screening processes, and then uh, our team will go in and do those interviews and make sure people pass through that. So kind of a proprietary system that we have set up for screening each of the different levels or different types of expertise. And so we do that on a uh, expertise format by format. So does somebody know Facebook and Instagram marketing really well? Does someone know SEM marketing? Does somebody know email, you know, demand generation, et cetera. So we're one by one, we're building up uh, each of these different um, different screening processes to make sure that we have a, a high bar of talent across the board. The screening then is done by a human and not by a bot? Yeah, it is done by a human uh, as of now, as of now. As of uh, now, in, yeah. In the future, we might go down the bot route, but you know, we have to make sure the quality control is there, right? right. And then also that we don't have biases built into the system. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we're kind of equal opportunity and we're not, you know, taking people away for some, some reason that, that a computer or machine learning algorithm determines is a reason to turn somebody down, but it's actually not a good reason, right? That there isn't bias built in the system. And, you know, humans can be biased too. Um, oh, absolutely. We wanna, Believe me. I, you know, I've worked sure for, that we at least take it into account, right? Yeah. Yeah. I've worked for 15 years in, in recruiting and talent acquisition, uh, in, in that space. And those are the conferences I, well, I used to go to, you know, when there were things like live conferences, of course, now everything has moved, you know, to virtual online stuff. So, you know, back to the COVID thing, how has that impacted, um, you know, 
growth talent? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I would say, um, you know, it's a little bit difficult to say because we've been trying to scale the business up during COVID. So we didn't really have much of a before metric, but I can see the greater trends from a marketing perspective too. Uh, and from a marketing perspective, right, COVID has created winners and losers. So if you're looking at, um, I don't know, we work with, uh, on, on the playbook side of the house, we've worked extensively with Imperfect Foods, for example, right? And they're a grocery delivery service. And COVID has really helped them, right? Because people right. want groceries delivered to their home. And so there's a natural increase in their, their new users coming in. And so there isn't as much of a need for marketing talent um, because you're naturally getting growth in, so they can drop their, their spend, et cetera. And the losers, generally speaking, have been, you know, travel and different industries like that, where, you know, they've had to just cut everything. Um, and so I think it's left marketing as a, as a, as a function in an interesting place because, you know, if you're on the winning side of that, you've got this great uh, tailwind. And if you're on the losing side of it, you have a huge headwind. Yeah. And so uh, businesses, I, you know, from what I've seen, have been reluctant to hire during this time. So for us, get, bringing growth out of market, the nice thing is, is it reduces the risk of businesses on hiring because you're hiring on an hourly basis. You know, we, we uh, you know, kind of hold the contract with the folks who are on the Rotel platform. And so they can kind of bring people in on an as needed basis. So it diminishes the risk for them, uh, which is also good for the people on our platform, because if the risk is diminished on the hiring side, there's a much higher likelihood that they're going to be able to get a gig. Um, so we, we've seen some pretty good um, traction, I think, as a result of that. Um, but I'm interested to see how it goes, you know, after we get this darn vaccine in place and all that, um, you know, my, my hope is that people will, you know, kind of ramp up even more so, uh, and that we'll, you know, see even more demand. Your, uh, formula is quite different from like, like an Upworks formula in that, um, you actually handpicked the marketer for the specific project. So tell us a little bit about that process, process, how it works and how you go about selecting someone to uh, take a role. Yeah, so what we do um, is right now, we, we uh, you know, when somebody submits a lead to us, uh, we ask a bunch of information on that lead form to get an idea of what they're looking for. And then we, uh, we reach out to them and we have a conversation and we learn about what they're, they're looking for. And then we have a matching process um, on uh, on our side. We kind of uh, you know search through our database of people and narrow down the matches that we think make sense. And then we'll um, you know we also know kind of the pricing side, what the client's looking for, what the the talent is looking for, and make sure that's aligned. And then we'll do a process of making some introductions and making sure it's a good fit. And if so, they're um, they're kind of off to the races. Um, so far, it's worked really well. Um, we haven't had any complaints around the, the, the jobs from either side, with the exception of sometimes people want more hours, but, you know, that might make sense. Or they might want more from the talent and the talent has hours, right? And so, you know, we'll have to plug another person in um, or find another gig for somebody. But um, uh, for the most part, the quality side has been working out really well. Back to this whole idea that you're basically operating as a recruitment process outsourcer, an RPO company, in that you ha you're holding the contract with the company who is hiring the talent, or mm -hmm. not hiring, but hiring is the wrong word because they're bringing freelancers in for project-based work, Correct. Uh, yeah, you are, you are whole, you are doing the 1099s. You're holding the contract. You're the ones, you're the one, you're not even, I wouldn't even call you an employer, right? Yeah, no, I wouldn't call it an employer either. Yeah. You, you don't want to be called an employer because you don't want to be put into that position, um, in the state of California where you're considered an employer. You are a, a platform like an Uber or a Lyft. Yeah, I would say that's right. Um, and, you know, 
the way that we see it is, yeah, we're, we're providing the service to both sides, right? So we're providing the service of helping freelancers to find a company looking to hire them. And we're helping businesses finding freelancers. And, and then we're helping with the paperwork uh, in between, right? So all the paperwork and kind of back-end processes, payments and all those things, invoicing, we handle, which, you know, for freelancers especially is a pain, right? Right. Um, so it's, you know, nice. They don't have to deal with any of that. They don't have to issue invoices and track down payments and all those things. We handle it. On the um, employer side too, it's great that you're doing the 1099 that you, they don't have to worry about that stuff because that's always a pain, especially yeah. for small, small startups. And I'm imagining that a lot of the companies you are working with on the Grotel side are, are startups. You know, they can't, you know, they're not in a position to hire, uh, you know, a marketing director full time, but they need someone to come in, uh, you know, on a project based basis and help them. Right. Yeah. Or they, you know, or they want to go test a new channel. They need to build into Facebook and Instagram. They need somebody to come in, build out their email marketing. You know, there's so many different places where they might want to plug somebody in, but generally speaking, yeah, they don't, they don't have the budget to bring in somebody full-time or they want to uh, test before they buy, right? We do have ways where people can hire full-time if they love working with somebody. There's, a, you know, there are buyout clauses that we have. Um, but uh, but for the most part, yeah, it's that kind of project base. We don't need somebody full-time. We need them, you know, 10, 20, 25 hours a week. I'd like to get an idea of the range of marketing experts that are on your platform, uh, you know, outside of what you talked about are people who, you know, maybe expertise in, in Google ads or face, you know, doing Facebook projects. Um, are you dealing with uh, video editors and artists and, um, you know, people who are out more into the creative side of marketing rather than in the management or production side of marketing? So yes, we do have a few of those folks on the platform. Um, it's a little tricky. I think that's more of like a 2021 for us to fully productize that. So somebody can come in and say, hey, you know, graphic designer is really easy, right? So right. graphic designers, absolutely. But when you get into video editing and actually creative production, there's so many different pieces in there that, uh, you know, it's hard to say I want one person, right? Because, you know, you need a lighting person, you need a camera person, you need actors, you need all those different things that are going to do our creative production. Um, so we, we do have that within the playbook side of the house. We do a bunch of creative production and partners uh, that we work with on that side. And so within Growtel, uh, one of my big goals in the next year is to build out sort of a creative side of it. And I think that the idea there is to either be working with independent production studios, independent providers who can, you know, subcontract underneath them, but the logistics are a little bit more difficult uh, yeah. you know, versus just hiring a singular person. Although, you know, you look at someone like myself who prior to COVID, I, you know, my business was mainly going to conferences like uh, Unleash and uh, ERE, which are in the recruiting talent acquisition world, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Large events that attract vendors like, um, you know, SAP and, you know, very large you know, IBM, very large companies, work, uh, Workday. Um, and I would shoot, you know, marketing videos at these events, um, do a lot of work in booths with companies with client testimonials and all that kind of stuff. Well, guess what I'm doing now? I'm, I'm a freaking Zoom wizard. Everything I'm doing is, is on Zoom because there are no live conferences, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, Zoom has really saved my life in a lot of ways from, you know, standpoint of being able to still create some income because I'm really good at editing Zoom videos. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, People have just had to readapt, you know, their skill set to the new reality. And I don't, you know, I don't know what you're projecting, but I don't think there's going to be any live events for another year. Yeah, I would 
probably agree with that unless we can figure out this, what is it, Operation Warp Speed and get this vaccine out really quickly. Fingers crossed. Uh, but yeah, no, I would agree with I would agree with that. I mean, videographers and video editing is certainly something we can we can bring to the table. We have some of those folks on there too, um, and people do need to adapt quickly, right? Right. And that's you know if you're if you're laid off, if you're a marketer who's been laid off, um, or, and there are a lot of those. Yeah, yeah. you know, and, but the thing is, is that there are businesses who are looking for your expertise too, right? And the trick is, how do you find them? Um, how do you, if you're sitting here, you have all this great expertise, there are a lot of people out there that don't know how to go look, and maybe they're going on Indeed and LinkedIn and applying to things. But, you know, my, my hope and my dream is that Growtel can be a, another outlet for them, right, where we can help, you know, this great talent pool to find the businesses who need their talent. Um, and if we do our job well, we're going to you know, build up that marketplace to where even in the future, right? If you're a great marketer, you truly have the choice. You have the choice whether or not you want to be working full-time for a business because, you know, this situation that we're in has now trained, you know, even the, the most stodgy old businesses that, hey, you can, you can hire people across the country who are working from home, right? And they're going to do a great job. Um, and so if, uh, you know, I'm betting on that future. I'm betting that we're going to be able to provide that service um, on an ongoing basis. Well, you're in San Francisco, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. South we'll America. talk about a city that has been completely turned upside down from this goddamn pandemic, and that's San Francisco. I mean, uh, a lot of folks that I know who run businesses in San Francisco are telling their employees, hey, you know, you can work from home as long as you want. If you want to move to Montana, you can move to Montana, right? Uh, we're not going to pay you the same that we paid you when you were working in San Francisco, but uh, you know, it's still cost of living kind of a thing. So yeah. it, you know, this is, it's, this is just really interesting. I think Brian, on how, you know, how businesses are going to adapt and, and, you know, for years companies said, Oh, you can't work at home. I mean, you have to come into the office. You know, we need to have the the team together and have our, conference calls and meetings together and I was gonna I was gonna agree you know it's funny as you mentioned that um companies that are uh forcing people to take the pay cuts if they leave um well I have a bunch of friends at reddit uh a lot of you know facebook people went over to reddit right uh, and uh and they just announced that they're gonna pay everybody the same regardless of where they live uh which I thought was a really good play on their part because that is, yeah. You know, one of the things that's, you know, so attractive about living in the Bay Area, right, is the pay from the companies that you work for. So you come up here and you work for a Facebook or a Google or, a, you know, Dropbox or whatever, right? And you get this great pay from living here. And then, you know, COVID hits, you want to get out, you get away from it, you get a much better cost of living somewhere else. And then they tell you, oh, well, but you're going to have to take a pay cut. And you're kind of like, well, F you, I have to take a pay cut. Why? Like, have you seen your earnings lately? Like, have you seen how much money these companies are making? Why would you have to give me a pay cut? Because I want to do the best thing for my family, right? Right. Um, and I just, I just disagree with that at face value. Um, but that's, you know, sort of... Well, you know, California this year If you this can afford to pay just... them out in California, you can afford to pay them out in Bozeman, Montana, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, and California, just you guys have just had a double whammy this year with not just COVID, but with all the fires and the bullshit that's going on out there, you know. Yeah. Um, it's unbelievable. Yeah, fires, COVID, regulation, <laughs> all the stuff that's... Yeah, and, and you know, what makes a place like San Francisco so attractive is the restaurants and, you know, going out and the, the community... And there's no community right now because there can't be. Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, I lived in San Francisco for five years and, uh, you know, I love living in the city. I, I love San Francisco as a city. And, you know, I'm in the suburbs now and I moved to the suburbs because, well, they have, you know, the way they do schools there and I have kids and, you know, now right. I'm in better schools. 
And, you know, it's it's been interesting to watch the city. You know, I think before this, it was having some troubles and now they're having a lot of troubles as a, as a city, um, you know, with everything being shut down and the homeless population and all the different things. It's uh, it's tough. Yeah. And I was just reading, um, I forget uh, who it was, but it was um, a prominent venture capitalist who's just moving to Austin. Um, and he's saying, I'm just, I'm just done with it. I'm done with California. I'm done with San Francisco. We're going elsewhere. And that's, yeah. gonna, that's sounds like a Tim, Tim Ferriss story, right? Yeah. 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 It's, it's definitely a trend. Um, not one I want to see because I love the state, but, uh, but I, yeah, I know me too. I, I, you know, I lived in Santa Monica for many years and uh, I, I love, I love it out there. I, I really yeah. do. Thanks for taking time to speak with me. Um, do you think that uh, you're going to take Grotel into other disciplines, but beyond marketing? Is that you know, I that isn't on the immediate radar. No, um, I think that there's uh, there's a huge huge potential within marketing uh, itself. You know, there's you know if you look at marketing services, it's a hundred and nine billion dollar industry, um, and I think uh, you know really beyond just going into growth, uh, which is kind of where we're focused is growth marketers right now, right? So people who venture backed, fast growth kind of companies. There's a whole nother echelon that we need to get to, which is looking at the big agency ecosystem, right? And it's interesting for me to say that because I run an agency too, right? But I think um, if you look at the, the, the large agencies and the people I've, I know there and I've worked with, there's a lot of waste there. Um, and I think that you're starting to see the in-housing conversation happen on a much bigger levels, you know, from from the, the big agency holding companies. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity for us to kind of get in at that level and build much larger teams for people to work with um, and, uh, and do it more efficiently and get higher pay out to those individuals as well. Um, Cause I think there's just a lot of waste in their models. So I think that's probably our next stop, um, not necessarily getting into uh, other levels of talent. We want to kind of stay focused. Well, on the financial side, how does this whole thing work? Do you charge uh, the companies a per percentage, a commission? Um, yes. Yeah, so how are you do, getting paid? We do a markup uh, on, the, on the rate, and we're transparent about what that markup is, uh, whereas you know, some other folks that in, in our space are not. Um, and so we're always transparent with, with the people as here's the rate, here's what our markup is. Uh, and so everybody sort of understands it. Um, and so it's usually on an hourly basis, sometimes on a project basis. Well, again, Brian, best of luck to you. I think uh, what you're doing is really interesting. And uh, are, 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 do you guys have some venture cap behind you or angel investors or how, how are you financing this thing? Uh, not yet. Right now we're, uh, we're financing it from, you know, basically bootstrapping. Uh, but you know, we're going to be looking into financing and uh, going into next year, um, you know, proving out the model, which honestly, I mean, it's, it's growing quickly. I think we're, uh, you know, around a hundred thousand dollars paid out to, to folks in just a couple of months. So, um, you know, it's growing fast. I think that there's a lot of promise behind it. So I suspect it won't be too hard to go raise some, raise some funds behind it. Um, but you know, there's a lot of pressure that comes with venture too, right? And so yeah, absolutely. Is, do you want to do that? Um, yeah. But I think if we really want to see our vision through, we're probably going to need a couple extra bucks behind us. Yeah. Well, again, thanks a lot for taking time to speak with me and uh, I look forward to staying in touch. And um, if you need a video editor, hey. Hey, you know, <laughs> you know how to get there. All you do is www.grotel.com and then you hit apply as a marketer and we got you. All right. That sounds like a plan. <laughs> Thank right. you, Brian. Thanks, Peter. Great time with you.